Well, okay, so let's let's dive in with your. So you're a marriage and family therapist. You got you have three kids. You're an author. You've you've done a bunch, and we're going to dive into into your book, which is just wonderful and exposing. And you know, I felt like every light in the world was shined on me as I was reading it. But so I want to hear a little bit about how you got into the, the practice of the marriage and family, and then how that kind of seg- segued into you actually putting pen to paper and writing a book. Sure. Um, I think it was probably the most formative experience was my study abroad experience um, as an undergraduate. Um, it, at my particular college, it was common to actually go for the whole year. Um, so 70%, at least at the time, sophomores are just gone <laughs> for the whole wow. year. Um, and that was just a really formative experience. We lived in one house with 50 other college students. And, you know, this was pre iPhone. I I think the iPhone maybe came out the following year. Um, so, I mean, Skype was mediocre at best. Like it was just very difficult (laughs) to, uh, have those supports that you were familiar with, um, contact back home and, you know, we had each other and, um, I think, new parts of people's stories were coming out during that year and people were sharing really vulnerably and understanding things about themselves naturally being away from home for that long for the first time and in a new environment. And uh, the the faculty family that went with us and lived with us that year uh, had just sort of been observing me and um, how much I loved hearing people's stories and being a sounding board for people's growth. And obviously I had a lot of learning and growing to do that year as well. And I just loved it. And so much so it didn't occur to me that I could do it for a living. <laughs> <laughs> you can get paid for this. Yeah. Amazing. Right? Um, and she claims she has never done this before and never done this since, but the faculty member, took me out to coffee and just said, are you sure you don't want to be a therapist? And it was just one of those uh, watershed moments where God felt like he just switched on the lights. And I said, yes, I do. And changed all my classes and never looked back and went straight uh, to Fuller Seminary afterward for my marriage and family therapy degree. I'm always amazed when things like that happen in life, when something, when just by a suggestion and how many suggest we get, you know, yeah. thousands of suggestions all the time, you get that one where it clicks and it's just like, it's almost, and you, you know, you hear people say that your what is your subconscious works like 10 times faster yeah. than your conscious brain. And so your subconscious recognizes it much more mm-hmm. quickly than you do. Right. It sounds like that's what yeah, happened. Completely. Completely. And then, you know, the writing piece took me a little bit by surprise. Um, I had done a lot, a lot of academic writing alongside my mentor who actually created the model that I used in my practice called restoration therapy. So I had co-written some books with him. Um, and then right after I graduated, we got a surprise move to the East coast. (laughs) Um, another watershed moment for me. And that was the beginning of a season that could largely be characterized by change and loss. Um, my husband and I went through a lot of infertility and had five miscarriages in so many years and just adjusting to a place that I struggled to call home and um, a lot of pushback in my career. And that really exposed, I mean, you talked about how my book, What If It's Wonderful, felt like it was exposing you. This experience really exposed Hmm. how much I needed to practice what I was preaching as a therapist, um, in terms of what makes me significant, what makes me safe. I believed a lot of those things, um, but I was not putting my full weight on it. Um, a, a lot of what I put my significance and security in was in my own performance and accolades from other mm. people and being impressive to other people. And it wasn't till I lost all that, <laughs> that I was given empty hands to receive Jesus in, mm. an, in a different way than I had received him before. 
what it says as a therapist, I mean, as all of us, as, as humans, we struggle with, with shame. And when something, especially when you're, when something is based on mm-hmm. performance and then it gets, you realize that you're not as, maybe not as good as mm-hmm. it, as you thought, and maybe you were, you know, what shame jumps in, but is that even more magnified as a therapist? You're like, no, I'm, I'm supposed to do this better than everybody else. So it's almost like performance multiplies performance. Did you go through a period of that? And when you, when you realize that, like, holy crap, like this is my job and I can't even do it that great. And and to be honest with you, fully honest, I still struggle with that. Um, yeah. a, A feeling will take over and I'll, I'll know in my head that that is not that the feeling is real but not true about who i am because i do believe there's a difference but it takes a lot of discipline for me to act on what i know to be true and not react Hmm. to how i feel and naturally um i i'm a shamer anyway um that's one of the ways i cope with my pain um so for me yeah naturally there's there's that first layer and then there's the layer of, and I should know better. Um, Mm. You talked about what if it's wonderful being exposing to you, it's exposing to me all the time. (laughs) It has to be be, right. Yeah. And I, I really um, struggle to celebrate what is and um, to embrace what is good in the moment and not wait for that other shoe to drop or not tell my joy how it can be improved upon. Um, so that's just one example of, gosh, I should be, I should be better at this. But when right. you think about the, that, the brain prefers what is familiar, not necessarily what is good and true. Um, that helps wow. me have more grace for myself because I had, I mean, you and I had how many years of <laughs> practicing, that lie in yeah. our brain hearing that lie. And so it just takes practice. We have to help our brain become more familiar with the truth. So it actually prefers that option and it won't until it, it becomes familiar. That's such a, that's such a, a challenge. And and I think I, I struggle with mm. the shame too. You you struggle all the time. Like what's, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get this right? I see, um, do you see any connection? This may be no correlation. Maybe just shame is just a human condition. Do you see, you you clearly have empathy. The fact that going back to your college story, like empathy is a superpower of yours. Do you see a connection between highly empathetic people and shame? Is there any kind of connection there? You know, I hadn't thought about that before. Um, It would make sense to me. Um, And as I'm rifling through some examples that I'm thinking of in my own life of people that tend to shame when they're in pain, yeah, I, I think, um, yes, I, I would see that as a connection, but I don't know that that's been researched or officially yeah. uh, stated, but so we yeah, just that's made right. news. So we just, Break, yeah, we, we right just here. made news right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, my, my daughter the other day, um, who is just the most wonderful, beautiful 13 year old wow. in the world. She, she had gotten a new sweatshirt and she got something on it and it stained it within uh, days. And and she's, she's shown a tendency from when she's young. She's like me. She has, she tends she's, you know, sometimes can be a very beautiful mess. And so she was in tears. What's wrong with me? What, you know, why can't I keep things right? And I, and I went to, we were on an, on spring break. And so I went and got her the same one. I gave it to her and I told her, and I was just in, in my mind and whether it was, you know, God prompted me towards it was just making sure I affirm her and said, Hey, I don't want you to just accept who you are. I want to mm-hmm. celebrate you, who you are. I want you to celebrate who you are, knowing that sometimes when something beautiful is being made, it gets a little yeah. bit messy sometimes. Oh, I love that. So how do you, how do you deal with your, and you all have mm-hmm. three kids, right? So how do you deal with this? What you said, but in letting them know, kind of reinforcing the truth. How do you do that from very young age with kids to make sure they don't get into that very natural shame cycle Mm -hmm. as they get older when things aren't going well? How do you really embed those neural pathways from a very young age for kids? You know, it's something I've thought about a lot since uh, the book released last year, because one of the questions I get most often is from parents. And they're essentially asking me some version of, of that question. How do I help? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have a healthy relationship with celebration, but how how do I help my kids essentially celebrate who they are? And this is puzzling to me because um, 
alongside getting all those questions, I was starting to notice in my own practice, I see a lot of adolescents, and I was starting to notice this phrase I just kept hearing over and over again from them. And these are pretty accomplished, um, solid, good kids. And they would tell me, Nicole, I just feel like a walking resume. And in some Mm. ways, this was confusing to me because I'm pretty familiar with a lot of the families um, that these kids come from. And these are loving, uh, warm, um, often Christ-centered homes that that these kids are in. And yet this was the prevailing feeling is basically that I only feel as good as my last performance. And Mm. so what, what... I was thinking of, especially in the context of celebration, because the practice of celebration was something I was talking so much about at the time, was that more than how often we celebrate our kids, the timing of when we celebrate is just as important. And your example with your daughter made me think of that, that the most natural knee-jerk opportunities to celebrate are when we won the uh, the little league game or when we got that A, we studied really hard and we got that A on the test or we finished that project or all the college applications are in or we got into the school, you know, where there's an obvious oh. reason to do so. And I am not suggesting that we stop celebrating those things. Those are yeah. fun uh, milestone moments that we need to celebrate. What I am suggesting is that we discipline ourselves as parents to expand those opportunities to celebrate and don't wait for a quote unquote reason. Um, Hmm. Because I think even for us, as, as we think of the opportunities we take to celebrate things in our own lives, we think that we have to have a reason that celebration comes on the far side of a goal achieved or a dream realized when really at its best, it's practiced as a rhythm <laughs> um, and, and yeah. not necessarily a reaction or a reward. And this is so important for our kids because it, it says exactly what you said to your daughter. I celebrate who you are. I love the gifts that you have and the opportunities you have to use them and the ways we get to celebrate the school play or the, the Little League game. But Mostly, I love who you are, and I want to celebrate yeah. this about you. Um, and I, I use that phrase a lot or try to with my own kids. Like, I just love who you are. And I am so mm. glad God gave you this quality because our family is so much better for it. Um, and you're yeah. the only one of the five of us that has this. And thank goodness, you know, just really making a big deal about their uniqueness at random times Um, or being able to catch lightning in a bottle like you did with the sweatshirt of, Hey, I actually really like this about you. (laughs) And it may be hard at times to have this quality. um, But what feels like a burden sometimes is actually really beautiful and will serve you well. Yeah, because if you deaden the corollary of someone's strength, if you deaden, if you deaden someone's, if someone who's creative, if you deaden the messiness, then you also deaden the creativity. 100%. If you 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 deaden the downside, you downside the up, you limit the upside, yes. right? Let's let's talk about the, and I don't want to skip over your first book, um, from <laughs> yes. lost to found, giving up what you want for what would set you free. I, I need to read that, but I have read what if it's wonderful, um, and it was like I said, it was. I said before, it was probably for women, but I'm telling you, it was for me and I do have long hair, but um, <laughs> no, it's, the, for, it's the, for everyone. Uh, it was, it was exposing. I, it, it's, it takes some vulnerability. You tell some really deep stories in there where you got to the point where your friend asked you instead of expecting mm-hmm. the worst, what mm-hmm. if it's wonderful? Will you talk about that journey that led up to that question and then how that hit you? Sure. Um, you know, a lot of people assume I wrote that book because I had a lot to say about joy <laughs> and was an expert in it. And I did do a ton of research in preparation for that book, but that book was born much more out of a season that could largely be characterized by change and loss, the the season I described mm-hmm. from my first book, From Lost to Found. And what I realized is when I started 
you know, I don't think our seasons are ever all pain or all joy, but certainly they lean in one direction or another. And I noticed that when I started to move from that painful season to a season with more good news and encountering some breakthrough in our story, I noticed that I was really hesitant to step into that. And I woke up one morning. I mean, nothing happened. It was just sort of a slow realization where I just woke up really grieved because I realized that, yes, I had experienced a lot of tangible loss in that previous season, but a lot of the loss I experienced was my inability or unwillingness to embrace the joy that was right in front of me. And I thought, no more. (laughs) I, Mm. I am done protecting myself from joy. Um, and in my research, I actually learned that I'm not alone, that joy is the most vulnerable feeling we feel. Wow. Because when we hold something, it's automatically accompanied by the possibility of loss. And sometimes when we've been through trauma or loss of any kind, it can feel safer not to hold that joy than to hold something that might break. And a lot of us are walking around uh, calling ourselves realists or relying on pessimism or cynicism in some way um, because we're trying to protect ourselves from some sort of vulnerability of joy, whether that's trying really hard and feeling like a failure if it doesn't work out or hoping and winding up disappointed. But what was so interesting in my research is that pessimism and cynicism actually don't lessen the sting of that outcome should the worst happen. And so not only are we protecting ourselves from a lot of joy in the process, but it doesn't even work if, and that's a big if, (laughs) if that outcome were to happen. And so, I mean, like we said, the brain still prefers what it knows. So research isn't going to be enough to help you trust it differently. But that really held up the mirror of, why are you doing this? Um, And then I did a deep dive um, into psychological research and, and scriptural research to understand how can we move through that vulnerability of joy and the practice of celebration as a practice became the thing that I think helps us move through. I want to hear about the yes. practice. There are a couple things along those lines that, 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 by the way, that, that line joy is the most vulnerable mm-hmm. feeling we feel is, and again, you talk about exposing, I just yeah. feel that I, I feel, I feel like the, the hesitancy is where, you know, building up a business with something good has, you know, something good happens and, but it's always met with, you know, like you've said, and you said in your book, just the distrust, like, can I really trust this good thing? Is this, Mm -hmm. is this something I can trust? Can I trust the celebration? Can I trust the joy? And I think another part of it for me is probably even expressing joy. I think maybe those around me, maybe a fear that others around me will think that I'm, I look silly for it or something. You know, it, it's a, it's a, it's not only internal, but it's external as well, or my perception of external, which would a, what a, what a poor outlook. Like right. if I were to, you know, think my wife would think I'm silly for mm-hmm. being joyful, that doesn't give her much credit. It's not really well-founded, but it's just another mm-hmm. defense mechanism against mm-hmm. joy. Yeah. I think we've been so trained to see uh, celebration as a reaction to good news or a reward for some kind of an accomplishment. Mm-hmm. And we, we feel that having a reason is a prerequisite and it is so yeah. much more healthy and connecting to practice it as a rhythm. Will you tell that story? What led up your friend who asked yeah. the story? What, what if yeah. it's wonderful? Will you tell that? That's, that's such a great yeah, story. So the title um, comes from uh, essentially a sign in my friend's kitchen. And I shared earlier in this conversation that my husband and I, had, uh, we have a really rare genetic condition, um, which makes it more likely for me to miscarry a baby should I get pregnant than not. And so statistically, um, it's a really scary thing for me to be pregnant because how do you hope when you know the odds are not in your favor and 
of course you want to meet that baby um, and you want to picture a life with them and your family with them. And in some ways it feels foolish to celebrate even being pregnant or to hope. Um, And so that's where I was (laughs) as I was sitting in my friend's kitchen and she'd walked through a lot of the pain in our story. And um, I was feeling this in other areas of my life too, just some dreams that I had for my writing and my career as a therapist and just not really sure if dreaming felt like a good idea. So this was all Mm. kind of buzzing around me like, the dust on pig pen from that Peanuts character <laughs> just kind of ever with me. <laughs> and I was sitting on a bar stool in her kitchen and it's a kitchen I've sat in many times. And I looked above her window and she has this cute little wooden sign that says, what if it's actually going to be okay? And talk about holding up the mirror. It was like, oh, that hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> like, And it just held up the mirror to how much I was practicing disappointment, rehearsing disaster, you know, living in this space of the worst case scenario, not even allowing myself to say, hey, what if it's actually really beautiful? And by the way, that doesn't mean what if you get what you want? That's what if the path before you is actually really rich? And what if there's something behind this curtain that you couldn't even dream up? if you tried. Um, and that's not a prosperity thing or, um, you know, getting what you want. Like I said, it's, it's more just what if what's ahead is actually really wonderful. And so I read this sign as if I was asking myself, like, (laughs) what if it's actually going to be okay? And she goes, Oh, (laughs) sweetie, what if it's wonderful? And that phrase became just a short, question to interrupt this line of thinking. So I started seeing this line of thinking because once you name it, you see it more often. Yeah. And what if it's wonderful became my phrase to interrupt that. And when I pitched this concept to my publisher as my second book, you know, we were sort of kicking around. We knew we needed a good title um, because the vulnerability of joy is not something we talk about a lot. And Um, we needed something that really captured that. And at first it didn't occur to me to make it the title. And I was, I think I was sort of feeling vulnerable about that title. Like, I don't know if they're going to like this. So I just sent it, hit send. And they got (laughs) back to me so fast and they're like sold. Um, and that actually sold them on the idea that this book needed to be out there. So, um, I don't know if I've shared that that part of the story before, That's but so cool. um, and people tell me all the time, you know, the book's been out just over a year, and that's the feedback. I one of the feedbacks I get most often is that just the title yeah. has ministered to people and changed yes. their thinking um, because it's not a question we we often ask. Usually, it's what if I fail or what if it's scary or what if I'm disappointed? You know, we, we don't often ask what if it's wonderful. Nicole, what I love about it, what I love about that question itself is it's very mm-hmm. disarming because it's not a, def- it's not a definitive right. statement. In, in, in other words, it's not, it, it's not a delusional right. thing to say. It's just a, because it, in our fears, we have heard someone say that fear comes to us as a fully formed mm-hmm. story. So when we, when we have fear, it's coming to us as a theory, it's theoretical, it's not happening. And you're just countering that with something else that's theoretical. Like, yeah, that could be terrible. What if yeah. it's wonderful? So it's not a, div- so if, if instead you countered it with like, no, it's going to be great. Then you'd be like, well, mm-hmm. you're an idiot. Like you don't know that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is that, that, that I think that's an interesting spin on it. You're, you're greeting a theoretical with uh-huh. the theoretical and no one can right. argue with it. Right. <laughs> you can't argue that. You're like, well, yeah, what if it is? Mm-hmm. It might be, mm-hmm. you know, it's such a power. It, it is such a powerful question of a couple things um, that I want to dive into to there. You said with your, genetic Mm -hmm. predisposition and this is interesting it's not just that you thought things thought the odds might be against you you knew scientifically the odds were against you and even then like that that's like that's pretty decent reason to not have some hope right (laughs) so even then i mean it applies there so that 
Um, and it makes me think about people who, and, and infertility is just such a prevalent mm -hmm. thing. And so many people struggle with it very silently. And it's, it's, it's shame. And I, many people around me, you know, it's a shameful thing. It's something they heard about. It's just lost hope and dreams. How do you talk to people who are going mm -hmm. through that or may have those infertility issues or even people listening right now? It's just, it, it may feel like they're mm -hmm. in the depths. They may feel like they're in the valley and not have hope. How do you talk to them? And what would you say oh, to that's them? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think the first thing we have to do is just honor our pain. Uh, we can't mm -hmm. move through what, what we haven't named. And this is not... Um, I'm glad you asked me this question because this is not about drawing a silver lining on clouds. Sometimes clouds mm -hmm. just need to be clouds and this isn't about making something good. That would be toxic positivity where we get into spiritual bypassing and, you know, saying silly, untrue things like, you know, yeah, I don't know what everything happens for yeah. a reason or, um, you know, yeah, those trite right. platitudes that are not actually truth. Um, and I think just to be able to invite others, invite God, if you're a person of faith into the feelings you actually have, instead of trying to have the perfect feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, one of the things I do in my pain is perform. I think if I, if I can yeah. just look really good or look like I'm growing and I'm mature and I'm brave, um, then maybe this won't happen to me. Um, and I know that's not true. I know it's not actually going to protect yeah. me from pain, but our brains are tenacious with those things that we rely on when we're in pain. Um, and so I think just to honor where you are, um, slower is faster. I think often we, and this is true for, if you know someone in your life who's hurting, our first tendency is to pull them out of that place that's so painful yeah. because we love them and we want to see them um, in a different place. And that comes from a place of love. I think what's actually most helpful is to sit with them in that place that neither one of you want them to be in. <laughs> Mm. Um, and that is actually the, the first step, naming what hurts, grieving that you're in that place. Um, if this is someone in your life, crawling into that place with them. Um, mm. And you don't have to agree with everything that they're saying in that place to validate the feeling. You know, I get this question from parents a lot. Like, I have this anx anxious kid and I'm worried that if I validate their feelings that I'm yeah. going to validate the reality of what they're afraid of. And that's not true. And you don't have to agree <laughs> with everything to validate that the feeling is real. Um, and I think, but until we get there, until we connect, we can't correct um, whether that's a friendship mm. or, or with our kids. That's a hard thing mm -hmm. as a parent too, because you know, what's on the other side of it, you know, when there's a little, when there's a tiff at school with, you know, with, with their friends, you know, we have the context to know everything's yeah. going to be fine. And so we want to immediately tell them everything's yes. going to be fine and it will be, but that's not really what you're saying is that's not really not relevant. Yet. <laughs> yeah. First, yeah. first they <laughs> yeah, have to know go. that you've heard them. And so find mm. some overlap, something that you can validate even if it's not in the situation itself, but just in how they're feeling in the moment. Yeah. And then I think it opens up more possibility. You know, I, one of the um, populations of people that I heard a ton from that I could have never talk about what if it's wonderful, I could have never anticipated <laughs> um, was a community of parents uh, who have at least one child with a disability of some kind. Um, and it was such a hopeful message for them because oh. here they have this situation that they thought that they didn't want, that, that there was some grief mm. around, um, for their child or for them. Um, it was obviously not what they had expected. Um, it was a huge curveball in life and yet they have found Yes, a lot of hardship and a lot of change, but a yeah. lot of joy. So much so that they can't picture their lives or their family's life um, any other way. 
And there are days where that's not the case and it's really, really hard and painful, but there are so many days where they've just been interrupted by this joy that they wouldn't trade. Mm. And I heard from these parents because a lot of them said, we didn't know if it was okay to celebrate. We didn't know that this thing that we're supposed to quote unquote grieve has actually brought so much joy and so much richness and we are so much better for it to our lives. And that's not to negate again, the heart and the pain of it, but this other part is true too. And we didn't know if that was okay. And I, I, I've done some zooms with these groups of parents and they're just sobbing um, and just feeling permission to celebrate what is good, even though it's a story that they thought they were supposed to be sad about, um, was so freeing. And I think to be able to hold what is hard and hold what is joyful intention, um, joy doesn't cancel the pain. (laughs) Um, again, that's toxic positivity. We don't do that here. Joy is able to sit and say, yeah, this is really hard. And this is also really beautiful. Just like you did with your daughter. And the gift that Mm. she has. Yeah, there's a challenging part of that gift. And there's also a really beautiful part. And we have to be able to do both. Yeah, that that um, the whole concept of practicing this is this being a practice, I think is what what is one of the turning points of the book for me was conceptual. And then just like when you've said it, like Mm -hmm. practicing disappointment, practicing like the discipline of celebration. Um, I don't think that probably most of us are aware of the fact that we're probably, or, or some of us, if you're like me, you, you are practicing disappointment. Yeah. I think I do that. I think I do that me quite too. a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just easy. Yes. It's so much easier yes. to, yeah, it's just, it, it is, it is, it is so much easier to do and let your, your mind run wild. And I think probably too, cause our brains are always seeking out the things that need to be corrected and not the things that aren't there or something like that. Yeah. So anxiety is one of my favorite definitions is it's our brain's way of trying to control what it can't. So it's scanning the environment for, for things that um, we could worry about (laughs) (laughs) in an effort to control the unknown. Um, And, and when we're faced with the unknown, that's why it's so important to counter that anxiety by, by asking, well, what if it's actually going to be okay? What if it's wonderful? So you have three, three sections here, the, the release your fears, choose joy and find the courage to celebrate. Will you touch on each one of those sections, uh, the re- release your fears, choose joy, and then find the courage to celebrate? Yeah. Um, the release your fears would be just understanding that vulnerability of joy. What makes joy feel scary? Uh, why does it require courage when it sounds like something that should be easy and natural, <laughs> but really just looking mm. at the things that hold us back from that, not not only in your own story, but because you're human and you have a brain and this is the way our brains operate. Left on neutral, the brain leans negative. Um, And there's all sorts of dynamics and reasons for that that I explore in that section. Um, Choosing joy is off can be a phrase um that sounds toxically positive that is not yeah um how we explore that in that section it's actually meant to be freeing and empowering um and that speaks to what i was talking about earlier with when we tell ourselves that we need a reason to celebrate um that's incredibly disempowering <laughs> now wonder we're yeah. feeling vulnerable Now, wonder, we're just hoping that it all turns out okay so that we can celebrate. Um, When really, when we practice it as a practice, um, we can start to move in a new direction. Not that we are dismissing what is hard um, or painful in our lives, but that we can actually make some choices in stewarding that pain that helps us connect with God and other people. Um, and with ourselves in a, in a different way. And then that, uh, courage to celebrate is where we actually get to practice that courage. And I outline lots of different practices and what, cause when I thought of celebration, I naturally thought of like a big party or somebody who's good at event planning or good at entertaining and hosting. 
Um, I'm working on it, but that's not me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sounds like a lot of time that I don't have and a lot of effort and a lot of money. And I really wanted these practices to be accessible, um, doable in a 30 second time frame, and able to be practiced wherever you are. Um, and so hopefully that was accomplished in, in those, in that section. I think it was, I hear from people that it's their favorite section. Um, but yeah, the, those practices are outlined in each yeah. chapter there. One thing I like about this and, and growing up in the church and, you know, still being in church, they, there's a, there's a certain message at times of deliverance, mm-hmm. you know, if, if, and I, I think that that maybe even from a young age sets this probably false expectation yeah. because we know I mean, it's a daily practice. You know, you die to yourself daily, right? And it's, it's a daily practice. The thing I like about this is it's maybe an acknowledgement to some degree. This is going to be a lifelong, not necessarily struggle, yeah. but just a practice. And there's, there's the deliverance. Yeah, maybe there's deliverance, but it's, but it's that deliverance comes, you know, a drop of water at a time every single day. And so I, the thing I like about it, it's just this practice that we can get into for yes, ourselves. Yes, I think, and that's, and research would say that that's how change happens. And sometimes, yes, deliverance can come a drop of water once a day, every day. Um, and sometimes <laughs> even when we have those watershed moments that we picture when we think of deliverance, we still have to practice walking in the new way. Um, yeah. That that moment of truth comes with a responsibility to keep walking forward in that truth. And so if your story includes some of those moments that you can return to that were really emotional and and really significant, great. Practice from there. If your deliverance has looked like, you know, daily practices that have helped you move one step at a time over a long period of time, I think that's beautiful too. Um, Hmm. But both stories require practice. We, our brains just don't change without it. There are a couple quotes that I saw on a lot of reviews in the book. Uh, there are a couple quotes that jumped out to me. One of them was was a really common theme, which which was this was this book was a mirror to my soul. This book was a book I didn't know I needed, and I love this. Nicole delivered a gentle "me too" that helped me feel safe, letting her into my darkest spaces. How, what does that feel like? You get random people that you don't know their names, and they're saying like, "This is a mirror to my soul." What is that like as an author to receive that? affirmation hopefully not going into performance but once yeah. again in the performance cycle but what what does that feel like to to get those and just know that people's people's hearts are being touched by this and their lives are being impacted by it uh, i could cry <laughs> um mm-hmm. it's it's the very best gift um the, i mean the reality of numbers and sales is of course there that's not my yeah. why <laughs> My why, it it honestly, I said this to someone the other day, it feels like I've stepped into Jesus feeding the 5,000 and I've given him my little Mm. lunch (laughs) and I just get to see him multiply. Mm. Like when you share on Instagram a, a book and what it has meant in your life, or when you share a review on Amazon or tell a friend about it, um, it, it honestly, when I get a peek at that as an author, it's just like, wow, what God did with the little, <laughs> with the message that he gave me. I yeah. mean, um, yeah. I, t- I talk about this in the book because often people are like, especially if you've grown up in the church, you've been taught that at times um, that celebration is somehow um, egotistical or that it's self-aggrandizing. And so people are unsure how to reconcile their humility with their call to humility with this invitation to celebrate. And I address that in the book because what I've realized is my hesitancy to celebrate is actually a sign that I've made it about me. So when, when Mm. you read those quotes, I think this is all God. He gave me the idea he gave me the opportunity to write it down. So I celebrate freely. I rejoice over each one of those because it's him. Mm. Um, and he's allowed me to 
think through a message to share it and and to, he spread it so i i'm wow. celebrating <laughs> i love it. <laughs> it's just, i like that it's yeah. very good all right i didn't i didn't i didn't prep you for this particular question and it's just come to me and so we can sure. edit this out if Go it's just a little it. bit too much but I, I'm, I'm curious what 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 is what's what would you say the what's the advice that you need most right now the advice i need most Give me a second, because I'm sure I have something. <laughs> and we can totally edit. We can. We can. We can totally edit. But I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you as mm. in practicing and, and in giving wisdom and, and insight to people. If someone were to really take a, a real inventory and just say, "Hey, you need mm. to hear this right now." Well, I'll tell you about a conversation I had with my husband a couple nights ago. Um, just thinking through all that I'm called to do. You know, I've got these three beautiful children. Um, I'm married to a great guy. I've been called to be a therapist and God has put these books on my heart and I, I hope he puts more. Um, and it can be a struggle knowing what's the right, um, amount of time. (laughs) Um, what, how are we doing these callings? together um and how are we doing them well and it's it's been heavy on my heart this week which is why i'm just thinking out loud with you right now (laughs) um but i was i was reading i can't remember whether it was in chronicles or samuel um but nathan um gives this he basically gives this wisdom of, yeah, like it makes sense to build that cedar house, like go build it. And then I yeah. love this. God comes to him in a dream and says, uh, you're going to need to roll that back. When have I ever said <laughs> that I needed to live in a cedar house? I never said I wanted a cedar house. And it just really highlighted for me, you know, we can make so many decisions in our different callings based on what makes sense or what opportunities we're given or what gifts we have. And often we don't ask, does God want me there? Does, does, is that where he wants me to be? Um, And simultaneously I'm preparing for this women's retreat where I'm going to do some teaching on kind of a, a biblical and whole view of femininity. And one of the talks is, our calling and how that's expressed in the community. And, you know, I know so many women that have passions or business ideas or callings outside their home. And obviously they're called inside their home, whatever that looks like too. And I think we're always thinking about what's the right combination or, you know, what does that look like for me? And I think the question I'm asking more is God, do you want me there? And so yeah, yeah. if anybody listening wants to call me and speak into, um, <laughs> and having the courage to listen to the answer, um, I think I feel really convicted in that because I can blow yeah. past some signals and signs that aren't telling me to go in the direction that I want to go. Um, yeah. And yet desperately wanting at the end of my life to look back and say, you know what, I'm proud of and and really blessed by the way I spent my time. And maybe it didn't look like hustling in the way that the world would have wanted it to. Mm. Um, But it was it was where God wanted me to be. Um, And so I, I hope that I step in the places he wants me to be. Yeah. I don't so know good. if that was I what you that. were looking for. <laughs> sorry to surprise. I'm sorry to surprise you. No, that was great. I did want to hear. I wanted to hear like the real time. That was real time. time. <laughs> what's going on? No, I love that. That was great. Are right, we asked this question of, of everybody on the RO podcast? The RO podcast is conversations with people who strive to live intentionally. So I'll ask you open ended, very broad, take whatever direction you want. But what does what is the word intentionality? What does intentionality mean to Nicole mm. Zasowski? Yeah, I think when I think of intentionality, I think of congruence and I say that because a lot of, and and this dovetails on what I just shared with you, a lot of um, the focus as a mom who works outside the home as well 
is on balance. Like what's the right ratio? Yeah. What, how do you, how do I know I'm checking the boxes and being all things to all people at all times? And yeah. I think congruence has become a much more peaceful way for me to think about that and an intentional way to think about that is, is the way I'm spending my time aligning, aligning with A, where God has asked me to be, and B, my values. Um, yeah. If I say this is important to me, if someone looked at my day, would would that be the message they took took home with them? Um yeah. Is is that the impression they would get? And and again, not as a performance, but just as an accountability. Um, and that really, it helps me put my phone away um, when I'm with my yeah. kids. If I'm saying that they're important to me and that eye contact is important and that I want yeah. them to feel seen and heard and celebrated for who they are, you know, as me being on my phone majority of the time, giving them that message, no. Um, yeah. and that's just one example. And I, I like that the word congruence allows for different things in different seasons. You know, when, yeah. when my book's releasing, it's going to be a unique few weeks <laughs> that's right. and they're going to see yeah. their mom work really hard and, uh, celebrate with them and, and share some tears and, um, and that'll look different than six months later. Um, when summer comes and, you know, we're just playing together most of the time. So yeah. I, I think congruence is what screams at me when I hear intentionality. I love that. It, it, it very quickly, when you have that real clear why, you have that real clear intention, you can very quickly eliminate distractions. And distractions, we, we say distractions, anything that gets in the way of mm. your intention. So you're very quick in that few weeks. Hey, book just released. I know what distraction is. I know what yeah. intention is. And so you're able to quickly eliminate those things. And it, and I, what I like about what you said is it it does. It ebbs and flows. It's different for seasons. And um and it's not always hard and fast. That's why we don't demonize phones at all. I mean, if phones are very yeah. necessary. And so there, but there are moments, you know, for us, you know, dinner time, it's probably not the right time. So I like how you define that. Um, and I'm going to put this on the, on the after show notes, but everybody does need to go get this book. This is, this is, um, I, I mean, it, it was um, very, very exposing. It's, um, it's something that when you get into the practice, it's not all, it's not all theoretical or just conceptual. It is get, gets down to the nitty gritty of practice, which I love. Um, where should people go to pick up a book? How can they go learn more about you, your socials? Give us all the things. We'll put them in the show notes too, but where, where sure. can people go out and, and, and learn um, more? I have some free downloadables that accompany the book on my website if you're interested, and that's a good place to connect with me. You can message me there too. It's just my name, Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, Zazowski, Z-A-S-O-W-S-K-I.com. Um, you can buy the book anywhere books are sold. Certainly it's on Amazon or if your local bookstore doesn't have it, they can get it for you. Um, and then I'm on Instagram the most in terms of social media. So at Nicole Zazowski there. Well, Nicole, you asked the, the cover of your book, asked the question, it says, what if it's wonderful? And I will tell you the ah, book is wonderful. You, it really is. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, here's, here's my two, two extra quick little nuggets. One, you're a brilliant oh. linguist. You, your word pictures are really oh, great yes. in reading. It's, it's super, super well-written. And secondly, my advice for you in writing a second book is this is such, and you said earlier, so good for parents and every parent has a question. How do I engender this in my kids? So whether it's a kid's book or whether it's for parents about this, this is, I think this deserves oh, a sequel. It's that thank good. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate those kind thank of words. You. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much for joining us on the Aura podcast. Oh, thanks for having it. me.